But I tell you what, I'm fired up and excited. We had a great service at LeCount today and the Lord speaking there. And today I just know that God's going to do something good among us this morning. So turn in your copy of God's Word to Acts chapter 8, verses 26 and 40. Acts chapter 8, 26 through 40. As we consider a message I've entitled, What Hinders You? Baptisms are one of my favorite things to do in ministry. It's probably a favorite of of all pastors. Um, When I look back through the list of people that I've baptized over the 20 plus years of ministry that I've had at different churches, uh, I see children, I see youth, I see adults, I even see senior adults and entire families and couples. and, And as I read through those names, I find myself smiling as I remember some of those people and their stories or I see where they've gone on and and what God's done in their life over the last several years. And some even caused me to laugh. Like one particular lady I'd kind of forgotten about until I was going through my list of baptisms. And this lady is only listed by lady from Cowboy Church. She doesn't have a name. She's just lady from Cowboy Church. But when I read that, I remember her very well. We were having our annual church picnic and lake baptism that we would do in in Forestburg, Texas every year. And that particular year, it was 2007, we had invited the Monte County Cowboy Church to join us. They were one year old. We were a sponsor church. And so they provided a big, nice barbecue for us. and, And then we went down to the lake to have worship and baptisms. And all of those baptisms that day were prearranged. And so everybody had come and we went down into the waters to be baptized. But just as I was finishing up with the last planned baptism for the day, this lady runs to the edge of the water and she says, can I be baptized too? And so I made a spur of the moment decision and said, absolutely. (laughs) And so see, she ran into the water excited and people on the bank clapped and cheered as she came. And this lady who was devoted to Jesus and unhindered came into the water and was baptized. And she spent the rest of the day drip drying because we didn't have any other clothes for her. But it was Texas and it was hot and it was dry, so it didn't take long. This morning, we encounter the story of a man who was much like that lady. He asked a similar question. He got a similar answer. And so we encounter this story in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 and 40, 26 through 40, where we read this. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And if your Bible has a little footnote at the end of that, you'll notice it's Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8, which the eunuch was reading. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture. And told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Divine appointments are thrilling experiences of the Christian life. When the Lord places a Christian in the right place at the right time to impact a lost person with the good news of Jesus, it is an amazing moment. 
Because typically, these are the easiest evangelistic conversations that we have. The people will often ask a question that throws open the door for evangelism so we don't have to figure out how to get from the weather to Jesus or LSU football to Jesus. We just make a beeline for the gospel when they open the door. Well, that is what happened to Philip on this particular day. On this day, an angel prompts Philip to just go to a certain place. And so Philip does not know why he was going here. He doesn't know what he would find there. He doesn't know what he would even do there. He just knows he's supposed to go, and so he goes. Following the angel's instructions, Philip journeys down a desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, given the war in Israel, every single one of us in this room knows where Gaza is today, and it was in the same place back then. In the first century, Gaza had the intersection of two important trade routes. The way of the sea connected the continents of Africa and Asia through Gaza, and then there was also a desert route upon which the angel told Philip to travel, which connected Arabia with the Mediterranean. These trade routes made Gaza a, a contested city, but it also a place where a lot of travel came to and from. So Philip heads out along this stretch of this road. He descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. And since this is a well-traveled road, he no doubt met many people along the way. But the angel does not prompt him to talk to any of those. But when he comes to this Ethiopian, the angel tells him, to go to him. It's interesting that in verse 27 we learn six facts about this Ethiopian man. The first is that he is an Ethiopian. However, it's important to know that this man is not from the Ethiopia of today. The name there is as much a description of his appearance as it is the nation. The word that we translate Ethiopian is a compound word that meant burnt face. And so this is a black man of African descent. And the really cool thing about this encounter is it reminds us that the gospel spread not only northwest up and around the Mediterranean and into uh, the Roman world, but it also traveled south into Africa. And so Christianity is not a white man European religion. It started in Israel and spread throughout the entire world. In fact, before he ascended, remember Jesus told his disciples, you'll be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, in that day, Jews popularly considered Rome to be the ends of the earth, but they also considered Ethiopia, Africa to the south, the ends of the earth in that direction as well. So while this man was not an Ethiopian of the Ethiopia today, we do have a good idea of the nation that he called home. In biblical times, the kingdom of Nubia, also known as Cush, was called Ethiopia. It was south of Egypt. It was west of the Red Sea, roughly in the region of today's nation of Sudan, northwest of modern-day Ethiopia. And so this man was an Ethiopian, but from this area. The second fact we learn about this man is that he is a eunuch. Now, the word eunuch means that the man had been at least castrated and possibly emasculated. The first um, type of operation would render him unable to father children. The other would enable him to have sexual, unable, in, cause him to be unable to have sexual relations at all. Either procedure was common for a man who served a queen as this man did. And most likely this man had been completely emasculated because of something we learn a little later. The third fact we learn is that this man is a finance minister in the court of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This Ethiopian so he holds an affluent position. He holds an influential position in the court, which means he is well-educated, which we see that he can read. He also is high up in government. The Ethiopians called all of their queens Candace, much as the Egyptians called all of their kings Pharaoh. And the reason they had queens instead of kings is because when the king was born, they venerated the child as the son God. And they regarded that what he, who he was was too sacred to handle secular functions of royalty. Therefore, then, the queen mother ruled on his behalf, and she was known as Candace. 
The fourth fact that we learn about this man is that he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now, the Ethiopian would have gone to Jerusalem to worship for only one reason. He was connected to Judaism in some way. So then the question is, how was he connected to Judaism? Many people at the time were attracted to Judaism because of its monotheistic religion and its moral and ethical rules and teachings. But what was this guy's connection to Judaism? In this first century, Jewish Christian commentator Stephen Gare explains that there were three degrees of Jewish proselytes, or what we call converts. The first was that of a God-fearer. That was the most distant from the Jewish proselyte. These were not actual converts, but they were Gentiles who worshipped the God of Israel, but they didn't want to adopt the Jewish practices and customs. The second level was a little closer in. It was known as a proselyte at the gate. This also was a Gentile who worshipped the Lord and then also adopted some of the Jewish practices excluding circumcision. The third level was that of a full convert to Judaism who accepted the faith, worshipped the Lord, followed all the practices of Judaism, including circumcision. Naturally, because of the issue of circumcision... This final category was mostly dominated by females who didn't have to be circumcised. And the second was dominated by males who simply didn't want to go through the process and surgery of circumcision at a later age when it would be extremely painful. Because this man was most likely emasculated, he could not be circumcised which means he could not have full entry into Jerusalem, and into Judaism rather, which meant that he is a proselyte at the gate. He, he, he cares enough about his religion to travel all of these hundreds of miles from his native land to Jerusalem to worship, but he's not able to go all the way into the temple to worship. He is this proselyte at the gate. He's as close to a Jew as he was allowed to get, except for all of the rules and regulations. The fifth fact that we learn about this man is that he is on his way home now from worshiping in Jerusalem. As a proselyte at the gate, he could only go as far as that title refers, to the gate. He could not enter into the temple. He had to stay outside in the court of Gentiles. Herod's temple had a warning inscription etched in stone along what was known as the balustrade that surrounded the sanctuary and it read this, the stranger is to enter within the balustrade round the temple and exclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. In other words, if you're not a Jew, don't you dare step past this balustrade, this curb, or you will be killed. Talk about guest services. Still, this man was such a worshiper of God that he had traveled hundreds of miles to worship from the curb. Think about that. He's devoted to the Lord. And, and scholars think that he had made this journey because he, he was coming to the spring feast of Passover. The Jews had uh, three pilgrimage feasts, the Passover and Pentecost feast in the spring, and then the tabernacles in the fall. Jews who were able to make these treks to Jerusalem would do so. And so evidently, this man wanted God so badly that he was content to travel some 200 miles to stand on the curb for the feast of Passover and worship away from the temple. And now, Philip meets him as he's heading home. The sixth fact that we learn about this man is that he's reading from the prophet of Isaiah. As Philip approaches... He hears this man reading out loud from the scroll of Isaiah. And there's a couple of cool things about this very fact. First, this man was reading his own scroll of Isaiah. That's further evidence that he is as close to a Jew as possible and also that he is a man of means because not just everyone had a copy of even one scroll. And so you need to be grateful for the fact that you can hold God's word in your hand. All of it. 
you can read all of it. Because only for the last 600 or so years has that been a possibility for the masses of people. If you're not in God's Word, you need to be in God's Word because we have one of the greatest privileges ever of being able to read His Word in our language to us today. The second interesting thing about what this man is doing in Isaiah is that he's reading aloud. And that, that, that's strange to us. But in the first century, it was customary to read aloud, even if you were reading to yourself. And so I guess if you went to a library, there was no librarian going, shh, 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 shh. The chariot's being driven by someone else. This man is sitting there, presumably, reading aloud this scroll of Isaiah. Now, it's interesting that the man is reading Isaiah as well, because Isaiah was particularly important to eunuchs. Because in Isaiah 56, the prophet declares the future, which promises that eunuchs will have a name better than sons and daughters. So while they might not be allowed into Judaism right then, later on there was going to be a time at some point when they would be sons and daughters. This eunuch has no idea that it's this very day that this man's, that he's going to experience the fulfillment of that prophecy of Isaiah. And he's going to be welcomed into the kingdom as a son and daughter of God. But the eunuch isn't quite to Isaiah 56. Remember I said if you had a footnote, that's Isaiah 53 that Philip hears him reading. And in a day when only the Old Testament scriptures existed, this man could not have been reading a more perfect text for Philip to take and share the gospel with this guy. Isaiah 53 is the prophecy of God's suffering servant. And if you read that text, knowing the story of Jesus from his birth, through his crucifixion, to his resurrection, it is like his life in poetry. And so, it is a perfect picture of Jesus' life. And it's always been a picture of the Messiah. Isaiah 53 is the clearest messianic prophecy in Hebrew scriptures. In fact, ancient rabbinic literature strongly attests that it was the consensus of the rabbis that Isaiah 53 spoke of the Messiah. And that stayed the case until the 11th century A.D. when a well-known rabbi said, No, it doesn't, it's not the suffering servant, it's Israel as a corporate body. And that rabbi likely made the change in reaction to the evangelistic use of that prophecy by Christians. Because when the competition starts using your stuff, you got to change your stuff. It doesn't matter that it's been that meaning for centuries and centuries and centuries. So, Philip is locked and loaded. Now, when I read this, heard this story in Sunday school as a kid, I guess it's because we just had a picture, you know, that we're looking at. And I pictured the chariot parked. Like Philip and the Ethiopian were in side-by-side stalls at Sonic somewhere between Jerusalem and Gaza. And, and they're parked there. And Philip overhears this guy reading. And they then talk about Jesus over some burger and tots in a Route 44, you know. But that wasn't how that was at all. <laughs> they weren't even stopped. What's more like is Philip's walking along. He hasn't interacted with anybody on this big long walk. This chariot passes by and the angel who is unseen but still guiding Philip says, hey, go to that chariot and stay near it. And so I picture now that Philip runs to catch up with that chariot. So this isn't a sonic stop. As Philip runs up to the chariot, he hears the man reading With a strange accent, but he recognizes what he's reading. He recognizes that the man's reading from the prophet Isaiah. So he asks, hey, I couldn't help but overhear uh, your reading from Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian then gives Philip this open door. He says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And then he says something really great. He says, hey, why don't you come and sit by me and we'll give you a lift And uh, you can just explain it to me while we ride along. Now, here's the cool thing about this. Sometimes when God gives you a divine appointment, he does it in first class. Because Philip has been walking all of this time. Some people say he'd been walking like 50 miles. And for a chariot, that was like somebody driving up beside you in a Rolls Royce and saying, hey, could you explain Jesus to me? And by the way, where are you heading? Let's just ride the extra 50 miles together. And so what do you say? Okay, I'll suffer for Jesus and get in your Rolls Royce. 
That's kind of what Philip does. He gets in this chariot. He's now with this Ethiopian who's hungry for the gospel. And go back now to the expression that the Ethiopian says. He says, how can I understand this unless someone explains it to me? It reminds me of Paul's word, words in Romans 10, 14, where he says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear unless someone preaches to them? People need the Lord, and people need to know about the Lord, and they need us to help them know about the Lord. Philip hops in the chariot. The Ethiopian focuses in here on Isaiah 53, 7 and 8, which describe the Lord as the willing sacrifice for sin. And then the guy asked, hey, um, who's this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And Philip's thinking, this doesn't get any easier than this. He says, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about a guy named Jesus. And notice it says he takes that whole scripture and he just tells him about Jesus. Philip takes this passage which has all of Jesus' life and ministry and death and resurrection in it. He unpacks the gospel as they ride along this desert road. Now remember how I said this man was coming probably from Passover? The focus of Passover being one sacrifice for all and substitutionary death. That's fresh on this guy's mind. Jesus is the perfect and eternal Passover lamb. And so this passage could not be more perfect for this guy on this day at this time in his life. And so Philip just connects all the dots for this guy. And somewhere along that road, this man meets Jesus, the Messiah, the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world. You see, no matter where a person is in the world who wants to know about Jesus, God can find them and send somebody to them. But the thing is, he sends us. And so perhaps God is calling you to do that with a friend. Maybe he's even calling you to a life of service as a missionary or as a, a pastor, one who would surrender their whole life in a Christian vocation to tell people about the Lord. The sooner you respond to him to go to that friend or the sooner you respond to him to be faithful to that life calling he's placed upon you, the sooner you can experience the joy of being used by God as Philip was in that chariot that day. Well, as they travel along, they come to some water. And the Ethiopian's statement is packed with meaning. He says, look, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Here is water. Passover is the only one of the three pilgrimage festivals that occurs during the rainy season. And during the rainy season, the wadis in the desert of, Egypt, of, of Israel fill up with water. And so here they're riding along through the desert road and they come to all this water. And he says, what hinders me? And so they both go down into the water. He then says, why shouldn't I be baptized in the NIV? A better translation is what hinders me from being baptized because the word hinder is an important word in Acts. It's the same word with which the book of Acts ends in the Greek New Testament. Here in Acts 8, the word is a verb. The last word of Acts is an adverb. It's there that we read that Paul preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ boldly and without hindrance. Without hindrance is how Philip followed the angel's command to go after that chariot. Without hindrance is how we must enter the faith. Without hindrance is how we should live out the faith. And so this, this man had been hindered from becoming a Jew. First he was hindered because of his ethnicity. Then he was hindered because of something that happened to him physically. He stood on the curb. He longed to be closer to God, but now he has found something entirely different. Instead of regulations, he has found a relationship in Christianity. And you don't have to identify yourself with some national group to become a Christian. Anyone can become a Christian, as they used to sing before it was not politically correct, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Because it is not one ethnicity's religion. Jesus is for all the world. 
Anyone can become a Christian who repents of his or her sin and enters into a personal relationship with Jesus. And so whereas this man was once excluded from the temple, now he is included in the family of God. And so excited about what all of this this meant to him, the Ethiopian wants to be baptized right then. He's not a closet Christian. He's not scared for anybody to know. He wants everybody to know, especially those who are closest to him, the people traveling with him. These guys knew him better than anybody else. And he wanted them to know of his faith in Christ. And so he asked, is there some technicality that you have why I shouldn't be baptized? And Philip says, no, man. No, nothing holds you back from coming to Jesus except sin. You're repenting from that. No ethnicity, no nationality, no other consideration that is external, artificial, superficial, man-made could hold you back. So they both go down in the water. Philip baptizes him, and Philip leaves suddenly, and the Ethiopian goes on his way rejoicing, which always causes us to ask, what happened to him? Now, what happened to this Ethiopian? We really don't know. But he presumably was the first person of African descent to become a Christian. The early church father, Irenaeus, tells us that he became a a missionary among his people. But he goes off rejoicing, and that's the last we hear of him. This story is powerful because it reminds us of the life-giving transformation that faith in Jesus Christ brings to us. The joy that we can find when we respond to the call of repentance and faith and the joy of following through on belief through believer's baptism. So the question comes to each of us today first, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you repented of your sins? The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the good news is that there is a way for our sins to be forgiven. That if we repent of our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. What we get or deserve for our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We deserve death, but we're off of life if we come in repentance and faith through Jesus So if you need to be saved today, then I would just ask that right there in the the quietness of your heart, you would pray, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I, I turn from my sins and I turn to you. Lord, I receive the gift of salvation. I surrender my life to you. I want you to come into my life and be my Lord and my master. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray something like that, you're saved. You right now have been born again just as that Ethiopian was 2,000 years ago in that chariot riding down a desert road. And in a few moments, when I extend the invitation to invite you to come forward to let the church know of your decision, you can be baptized today. And we would love to celebrate that. You don't have to be baptized today. We can do it another day, but we'd love to see that happen today. Uh, Perhaps you're confident you are saved, but you've never followed through with baptism. So maybe you just never got around to it. Maybe, you know, you were saved and and then you had a move happen and you weren't able able to follow through and it just kind of time went on. Maybe maybe you were scared to follow through because of the, the walking down front in front of people or being in the baptistry in front of people. Or maybe you were baptized sometime in the past. But then you realize later on, you know what? I wasn't saved when I was baptized. But you know for sure that you were saved at a different point. But you've never been baptized after that real salvation point. You see, baptism is believer's baptism. It's not, I hope to be saved one day baptism. It's, I am saved. It's a picture of what's already happened in our life. I've been buried with Christ in likeness of his death. I've been raised to walk in newness of life. I'm a new person. I'm saved. I got saved. And we celebrate that. And so maybe your baptism's on the wrong side of your salvation and you could get it on the right side of your salvation today. So if you need to be baptized and never have, 
then why not do that today? Let people know what Jesus has done for you. Unashamedly show the world that you have been saved, your sins have been washed away, that you have made a clean break with your old life, you're walking in a new life with Jesus. Unite with Jesus in baptism, unite with the church in baptism, and celebrate your new life in Christ with us. There are no private Christians, someone said. Only individuals whose private decision is revealed in a public demonstration. And baptism is that public demonstration of faith. And so today, the reason the service is different, the reason we're calling it Baptism Day, is you have the opportunity to respond to this message by being baptized. If you need to be baptized and you never have been, we're ready for that. And here's how you can do that. When I we begin the invitation as we normally do at the end of our services. I'll come down, we'll sing. If you're coming for baptism, all you have to do is go out one of these doors and behind the platform back here is the choir room and there are people going to be waiting at these doors to help you get ready. We have towels, we have shorts, we have shirts, we have undergarments. We are ready. If you want to be baptized today, there's great changing areas upstairs in the baptistry area. And while you're changing, we're going to continue worshiping and then we get to celebrate baptisms together. So that's the first decision that you may need to make. The second is, some of you prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. And you need to come and let us know that so we can celebrate with you. And I'll be down front as normal, and you could come and you say, Pastor, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior today. And we want to celebrate that with you. Some of you may need to make other decisions. Maybe you need to come and unite with this church. Maybe, as, as so many people have done recently, or maybe when I mention that you need to go across and talk to your friend about Jesus, or maybe you need to respond to the call of God on your life to become a missionary or a pastor or something like that, you know the Lord was speaking to you, and you need to come and say, I'm responding to that call. I'm giving my life to Christian service. So whatever that decision is that the Holy Spirit is prompting on you today, what hinders you from making it? Don't look for technicalities, because there are none. Jesus wants you to be obedient. Respond to him today.